I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's uh, an honor to be able to speak to you today. As mentioned, my name is Taivo. I work in the Estonian Ministry of Finance, and I've been responsible for gambling policy and drafting gambling-related legislation for a bit over three years. Unlike in Scandinavia, in Estonia, we do have an open license-based system, and uh, we've been regulating online gambling as well since about 2010. Uh, by today, we have around 15, 16 licensees. And unlike, well, colleague Francesco here from Italy, is from a large authority, uh, we don't have a dedicated gambling regulatory authority. There's the Ministry of Finance, responsible for regulation, which is me, basically. And there is uh, about five or four persons in Tax and Customs Board, whose duties are to supervise, to license, among other things, also gambling activity. So this kind of also shapes what our gambling-related policies can be. We can't be too hands-on. I mean, it's not feasible for us to, say, pre-screen every advert or... Uh, uh, license separately every every game offered on, on every slot machine. We have to try and be a bit more economical. But uh, we're supposed to speak about uh, responsible gambling today. And uh, the funny thing is, I'm not aware of there being any agreed definition about what is actually responsible gambling. I heard Silla saying earlier that this is basically staying within your budget, which is pretty good. But uh, then it brings the question, could the budget itself be irresponsible or not? Uh, by the way, problem gambling also isn't uh, defined anywhere. Uh, or at least uh, there is no agreement upon such a definition. What is defined, though, is, is gambling disorder. It has uh, made its way to the DSM-5, uh, defined as persistent gambling behavior leading to clinically significant impairment or distress. But this is clinically diagnosed by uh, several criteria and may be classified as mild, severe, or moderate. But it's difficult to diagnose, and, uh, and it's... Uh, it's actually not very common. Now, all operators, both public and private, it's, it's a mistake to think that public operators are somehow exempt of this. They need to deal with a conflict of interest between seeking profit, protecting gamblers from harm. And to an extent, this applies to regulators too. Gambling policy making is basically a balancing act or rope walking, so to speak. You have to balance between trying to raise money for good causes and uh, between trying to protect society from greater harm. And it's a decision between individual freedom versus social control. But that we don't know what responsible gambling is, well, we still have a certain set of goals that we're trying to, trying to reach. Most of all, we obviously wish to prevent criminal gambling business, such as fraud, such as unlicensed uh, operators. Uh, we wish to prevent underage gambling and exposure of minors to gambling prevent gambling disorders, and we also want to protect people who already have developed gambling disorders. And finally, there is not such a great agreement there, but we also wish to prevent severe financial losses. Now, this is something that the operators probably should be interested in too, and I'm 
glad to see it's been uh, already mentioned today that actually it's a win-win situation to have a long relationship with your customer. Because let's face it, a problem customer is usually a problem for operator too. Not only will he back the next day asking his money back, he will create a lot of bad press and finally some politician is going to take up a crusade against gambling and uh, overreact on it and then we're all going to be sorry. Now, um, I'm not going to too much detail in what the European Commission is doing because we already had Mr. Veltri talking about it. But um, last uh, meeting of the European expert groups of gambling, there was also a great presentation uh, from University of Dortmund researchers. And I've taken the liberty of uh, borrowing a few of their slides. Uh, especially this one, for me, was pretty interesting to see the proportion of use disorders among uses of, of different uh, uh, addiction causing substances or, or things. And we see that tobacco and, and alcohol and, uh, and different narcotics uh, are, so to speak, a lot more dangerous than, say, gambling, where the use disorder percentage is generally fairly low. And what this slide tells us is that it's generally said that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, uh, of cure or something like that, but uh, really there's a time when you need to really stop looking at preventive measures and start looking into really providing help and cure to people who are actually who actually have a problem, who are addicted. And uh, that's what we shouldn't uh, really forget. Because for states, it's, uh, it's often easier to put uh, requirements for operators rather than spend money and resources on treating addiction. This is something that Estonia probably has uh, a lot of ways to go as well. I'm going to go briefly into the model of, of gambling addiction as, as it was described to us. There are different stages. First, you, there's a sort of normal use. We're in the cold state mentioned before. You transition to risky use, then to harmful, and then it's either reduction or you go into chronic relapses. And what the studies have indicated is that transition to risky gambling is mostly caused by environmental determinants, such as how accessible games are, how they're advertised, peer relations, pre peer pressure, things like that. While transition to harmful gambling actually is more uh, individual vulnerability thing, uh, what you're like as an individual. Um, A bit of uh, a detour to uh, of what Estonia is like. As I mentioned, we've been uh, legislating online gambling for a long time. And the main uh, idea of the policy we have is that the best, the, the, the best uh, counter to illegal offer is sufficiently attractive, sufficiently versatile legal offering so that when people have the opportunity to go and play with operators that are licensed, they will feel less pressure to look for unlicensed operators. And that's really the first thing uh, that's your responsibility when you're trying to to foster responsible gambling because you can take all the measures you wish until you're blue in the face, but uh, if your people simply are playing with unregulated operators, this will be of very little use. And um, 
what also goes together with it is, is obviously taxation policy. We've uh, tried to keep our tax rate down to about 5% of GGR on online games so that uh, a small market such as we are would find operators who would bother to come and, and get licensed and take that initial investment. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, that Puff has, has done so as well. Now, if we speak of actual measures that a jurisdiction can take, there is never enough research into that kind of thing. It usually goes like that the politicians decide that we need to do something about it, and the next step is this is something, therefore we probably should do it. But uh, in case of gambling, the menu of different options really isn't that big. So at the risk of uh, repeating my Finnish colleague a bit, I'll, I'll go over a few of, of uh, things that really should be sort of baseline scenario uh, that is sort of universally accepted as, as good practice. Um, probably we should start with marketing. Now this is something that we regulate in Estonia as well. Uh, you really can't... Um, I mean, the, the, there are countries that have went for the easiest route and simply uh, banned gambling advertising. Uh, obviously, if you have a license-based system, you can't do that. You have an online operator coming to your jurisdiction. He has to enter it somehow. Uh, otherwise, he'll ask, well, I just paid the fee. I've licensed myself. How do I really enter here? And um, previously, we had sort of you know, fuzzy limitations saying that the advertisements shouldn't be no, too inciting, they shouldn't be describing uh, gambling in, in too positive light, which created a lot of, of arguments with Consumer Protection Board and the gambling operators. With one side basically going into the argument that all the advertising should look like, you know, the death adverts in, in newspapers, you know, black and white, uh, nothing flashy. Um, uh, it's, it's what happens when you have a regulation which basically says, well, you can advertise, but your advertising better not be effective. <laughs> uh, so we kind of changed that a bit. And uh, from saying what it shouldn't be, we said what should be included. We included a mandatory warning text uh, saying that Basically, gambling, at, gambling is not a suitable way to solve your financial problems, which uh, really should go without saying. But, uh, well, there are still people who, who need this sort of, of warning. This is, something, this is not something new anyway. This is what's done with medication, with payday loans, uh, with things like that. Actually, one day I was... Uh, uh, just taking a bus to work, and the, from the radio first there was uh, a medication advert with this ta -ta 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 mandatory uh, warning at the end. Then there was a payday loan advert again, ta -ta 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 -ta, don't do this. And finally, I think there was a lottery advert again, ta -ta 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 -ta, don't do this. And I was like, what have we done? <laughs> but reflecting later, it certainly killed any you know, any wish to go and buy a lottery ticket, so I guess it works. Somewhat. Of course, clear no underage gambling message, um, no campaigns in, in schools and such, There's really no problem with that. Information should be objective. Chances for winnings and losses should be spelled out where, where possible. Support options should be clear, available, and uh, also sponsor information uh, should be transparent. Actually, sponsor information is, is something where we sort of relaxed the rules to try and uh, 
and get a bit more of that as money to go towards uh, uh, sports. Mm. Another thing is uh, casino distance and, and spread and, and availability regulations. Basically everything to do with access. What has given uh, pretty good uh, results to us. We used to have in 2007, 2008, over 5,000 uh, slot machines and nearly 200 gaming locations. We, uh, we changed the tax uh, regulation uh, so that first it was required uh, for every gaming location at least 40 slot machines and then each slot machine had to pay a fixed amount of tax each month, month uh, regardless of turnover something like 450 euros and this in, in uh, conjunction with the economic crisis we, we basically managed to reduce the number of, of locations to around 60 and slot machines to around 2000. I've also written licensing here I probably should have started with it it's where it really begins uh, as I was saying, uh, having the operator with the, with the right uh, attitude and, and mindset is uh, half the victory. But when you manage to keep the organized crime out, it's uh, also not a bad start. And uh, blocking illegal websites and transactions, obviously, that's uh, what we're doing as well. We use the DNS blocking. People. Uh, often ask, uh, well, is it really effective? How does that work? I'm saying it's, well, it's not a Berlin Wall. It's more like a police tape. It sends message to would-be players that the site they're about to access is, is forbidden. If they really wish to access it, they'll easily enough find a way. But that's where we get to the legal offer being really available for them so they wouldn't need to. What's also a given for us? Player identification and verification. That's not even just a gambling problem, it's also anti-money laundering re requirement. That's uh, the fourth anti-money laundering directive uh, has to be transposed in a bit less than two years. This will probably affect online gambling as well everywhere. Currently it only affects brick and mortar casinos. We're uh, pretty lucky in that regard, you know, there's a lot of, well not a lot, but a number of countries in Europe where there really isn't even mandatory ID for people and not sure how they're going to cope with it. Luckily we have the electronic uh, ID card which can be used and is used for such purpose uh, to a great extent. Uh, also, as uh, buff people know, people use that to identify themselves when they are playing uh, slot machines and ships. That's to rule out uh, miners mostly because uh, unlike uh, casinos you really can't do the door check. One minute, Mr. Perk. Yes, and um, a few gambling-related measures. Self-exclusion should be a given. We have a central self-exclusion list for, for all operators that we're uh, expanding also to sports betting and lottery this uh, coming year. Options of self-imposing deposit limits. When a player registers, operators required to offer him or her an option of setting himself a stop-loss limit. If he wants to change that later, it will take at least, say, 48 hours uh, time for him to reconsider. There's also required that information on gambling uh, stakes and losses and, and feedback on statistics is important. Well, it's a question of, of how in your face that really needs to be. We, ha we aren't regulating that currently. It could be a lot more intrusive 
then again, it would probably disrupt play experience quite a bit. We might be really effective at getting people off uh, from playing, but well, then they might just save their money and go buy an iPhone. Is that really what we want? Are we making them a favor? Um, no, no credits. Uh, operators can't give credits to players. Uh, obviously, forced random breaks is a, is a good measure that we currently do not use. But uh, this is again about you know giving time for people to come out from that hot state of mind, go into cold state of mind. That would be something that we would consider if uh, there was a problem with, uh, with uh, irresponsible gambling and, and addiction. And we, of course, can't forget staff training. Uh, you have to train your staff to, so they would be able to notice uh, risks, indicators that people are paying too much when and how to intervene. And I'm afraid, Mr. Yeah. Perk, that we have run mm -hmm. out of time. Yeah. <laughs> so just a quick ending there. It, it's, as, as was said, very much really depends on little things. How your casino or online casino is designed, how it's licked, what sounds there are. That's something that a regulator cannot and will not regulate. It's up to the operator to really make this effective if he understands that long-term relationship is, is really in his interest. So just credits for, for the slides I, I used so you, you know where you can uh, get more information if you wish from the Alice Rep project, for instance. Thank you. Thank you.